go to about five, sir. I think it's going to go. All right, I'll talk too long, but let's get on the questions quick. Uh, if, you, if you do have a question, if you could please uh, raise your yeah, hand, we and then we've got people with microphones in the aisle, and that would be great. All right, there we go. Yes, sir. I want to understand how the person who's leading our country isn't an anti-Semite by the way he treats Israel, sets back the peace process by decades, by leaving someone sitting, by not having photo ops. Yeah. How does a person, also, how does a person internally give someone who tries to uh, destroy 200 lives on a plane over Detroit an attorney within an hour? Yeah. How he, uh, according to John Thiessen, with courting disaster, releases all military secrets, so now it's available not only to us, but to the yeah. enemy. Uh, I, I don't understand how that might yeah. work. Look, he's got a different worldview than we do. He does. I, I don't believe that he's anti-Semitic. I just don't. But I do believe that he. Ha I, I do believe that he that he is, that he has a sympathy for the Palestinian cause and an antipathy to Israel that is not in keeping with the with the bipartisan tradition of all of our presidents, starting with Harry S. Truman. I just don't believe he's right on this question. I do think Mark Thiessen, whom you mentioned, it's Mark, not John, wrote a brilliant book. After you finish reading mine. Get courting disaster. Look, I've supported President Obama when I think he's right. He was right in doing what he did in keeping our troops in Iraq and not giving in to the left of his party. He did the right thing. He did the right thing in Afghanistan. I didn't think he did, you know, he didn't need to sort of wring his hands for eight situation room meetings and three months of consideration just so he looks like he's thoughtful. But he did the right thing. And it wasn't easy for him to do. He's doing the right thing, and you may not know this, by continuing the policy of President Bush and expanding the defensive technologies that we provide to our allies in the Persian Gulf region and expanding America's military presence there as a tripwire. Having said that, what he has done wrong is things like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Look, that guy... I read some of those reports, not all of them, but some of them. I know some of what we got from him, and you know some of what he got from him. You know the tip of it. What we got from him helped us break up things like a plot to fly an airplane into the tallest building in Los Angeles, the Library Tower. It allowed us to, fo to foil a plot in which they were going to bring down 10 airliners over the Pacific simultaneously. They were weeks away from launching a plot, a program, an action, which would have flown planes into Heathrow and a Canary Wharf to office complex in, in London. And we got information from Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And the idea that we would put him on trial in New York City and give him access to not only lots of secrets that he could spread around, but also what he wanted more than anything else. Look, this is a guy who knew what was going to happen to him. He knew as the mastermind of 9-11 that he was going to either end his life at the end of a very long, dark period by, by, you know, by being allowed to expire naturally in some dark hole someplace, having never seen the, the, the light of day, or that he was going to be executed. What he desperately wanted and knew he could not have was the moment on the world stage in which he could make himself into a martyr, in which he could proclaim the injustice of America and inflame the Islamic world and recruit thousands of additional jihadists to his cause. And guess what? That's about ready what Barack Obama was ready to do and give it to him on the stage in New York City. Can you, look, we live in a global world. That, that, that what he said and did in that trial would be broadcast around the world, and anybody who thinks this is going to play out like some drama on law and order, where, where the guy says, yeah, you got me, I'm guilty, and I'm sorry I did it, is kidding themselves. <laughs> and let me just tell you how lethal this could be. Andrew McCarthy was the prosecutor who put away the blind shake. And during the course of putting away the blind shake, the defense asked for a list of all of the persons of interest that the FBI was investigating in connection with the blind shake case. So they had to hand over to the, def to the defense classified information as to who these people were. After 9-11 and after we brought down the Taliban, guess what we found in Taliban training camps in Afghanistan? The list of the people of interest that was handed over to the defense in the blind shake case. Sources and methods of intelligence would be compromised, and America would be much less safe if this were allowed to go forward. Now, I think he is beginning to see the light of reason, and we may have a military tribunal in private, in secret, where this man gets the justice that he richly deserves. Mr. 
Cairo, thank you for being at the library and thank you for coming to Simi Valley. And my question is, it was reported on local news channels that originally you didn't support Mr. Cheney being on the GOP ticket. That's so right. To expand? That's right. So it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it in the book for a reason. I wanted people, get people to get a sense of who George W. Bush was and how he thought. He's a guy, one of the exciting things, and one of the reasons that so many people w were able to stay at the White House for so long with such a punishing regime was it was fun to, to work there. Because you, you were prized for what you said. You did your homework, made your case, you won points, whether you're the president agreed with you or not. Look, he didn't keep me around because of my pretty face. <laughs> he did not keep me around because of my athletic ability. <laughs> he kept me around because he knew I would walk in and say, Mr. President, you're not looking so pretty. July of 2000, Bush is thinking about who his vice presidential running mate is going to be. We're looking at nine people. And Bush is sort of focused in on Cheney, the guy who's in charge of the process. But he's become convinced that he ought not to be in charge of the process. He ought to be the result of the process. He ought to be the nominee. And there are about six people who know this. The president, Laura, Joe Albaugh, Cheney, Karen Hughes, and me. And I'm against it. So Bush is coming into town. He calls me from the road. He says, come over to the mansion tomorrow morning. Tell me why not Cheney. So I show up about 10 o'clock. We sit in the Austin Library, which is a little room in the, in, the, in the governor's mansion in Texas named after the land speculator who founded Texas, Stephen F. Austin. Came from Missouri, wanted to make himself rich, was the founder of Texas. The room has the only portrait done from life of Davy Crockett in his western duds. There are lots of portraits of Davy Crockett as a Whig congressman in a black frock coat with a white sort of, you know, fancy shirt. But this is the only one of them done in his western duds. He's in his, in his deerskin outfit carrying his Kentucky long rifle with his favorite, favorite dog. And let me just tell you, he doesn't look like either Fess Parker or John Wayne. He just doesn't. <laughs> he looks like a dandy. The guy's got curls and he's sort of cute. And, you know, it's like... That's, that's not, yeah, well, no wonder they called him Davy rather than David. I mean, you know. <laughs> hey, Davy. All right, so, so we sit down, and Bush says, okay, give it to me. And I say, look, here are my eight reasons why we shouldn't go with Cheney, starting with, we don't need to worry about Wyoming's three electoral college votes. <laughs> Cheney had a very conservative voting record from a very conservative state. For God's sake, he voted against a resolution calling for the release of Nelson Mandela from prison in the 1970s. <laughs> we're we're going to go out and defend that one for a little while. The guy had his first heart attack at age 37 and has been practicing on it ever since. <laughs> you know, and I, the rest, of, you know, and I got eight of them. You know, it's like that. You know, we got a 12th Amendment problem. Can't cast the votes of the, of the, of the same state for candidates for president, vice president, who reside in the same state. Now, Cheney's from Wyoming, but he's registered at that point in Texas. In fact, you know, Bush has got a reputation as an oilman. In fact, I'm sitting in, Andy, Andy Malcolm, right there, who's standing up there, Andy Malcolm worked in the Bush campaign. Andy would have had to deal with these stuff. And so, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, we have worked hard to overcome the idea that Bush is a Texas oilman, so let's get the guy who's running Halliburton, an oil service company, let's get him as the vice presidential <laughs> running there. You know? Anyway, so I got my reasons. This goes on for half an hour. I'm laying out my case, and the governor of Texas saying, I don't agree with that, or what if I said this, or how would you answer that, or blah, blah. And we're going at it. We're going at it pretty good. At the end of about 30 or 35 minutes, I've run through my list. He says, you got anything else? <laughs> I said, no. He said, good. Turns to the guy next to him and says, Dick, got any questions for Carl? I'm thinking, great, I've just irritated the guy who's going to be the next vice president. And he, <laughs> and he goes around heavily armed. <laughs> I put it in the book, though, because I wanted the people to see that Bush wanted people around him who would tell him what they believed and make the best case for it. Bush called me the next day. He said, you're right on every one of your points, but that's all politics. You go figure out how to solve the politics. You can do it. He said, I got confidence in you. Go start working on that. But he said, I got a different agenda. I got to figure out who is going to be a good partner to me when I'm elected. And if something were to happen to me, something terrible were to happen to me, who would the country have confidence in that they were up to the job? 
and I feel that's Cheney. So you go work on the politics of it. It was his first presidential decision, and he made it months before he got elected and months before he was sworn in. And uh, thanks for asking me. Then look, that, that office is powerful. There's something about the prestige of the Oval Office. I'd have members of Congress. Look, I office 15 steps away. I'd have members of Congress in my office. They'd say, by God, the president's screwing this thing up. He needs to hear from me. And by God, we need those earmarks. And by God, he shouldn't be forcing us not to. My God, I'm going to go and tell him. Hey, let's go see him. We'd walk in. They'd say, God, Mr. President, you're looking really good today. <laughs> I'll tell you a true story. I'll tell you a true story. True story. Vladimir Putin. Tough KGB guy. I mean, this guy is like a Russian Tony Soprano. <laughs> you're around him, and he comes off as a tough, you know, you do me wrong, you're going to die. I mean, he is a really <laughs> KGB agent, you name it. He's making his first visit to the United States, first visit to the White House, standing in the Roosevelt Room, getting ready to walk into the, into the Oval Office. Door opens in the hallway. Walks in the hallway, door opens to the Oval Office, walks in the Oval Office. There it is, the HMS Resolute Desk that every president, virtually every president since Rutherford B. Hayes has sat behind. Wonderful windows looking out on the South Lawn, light streaming in, the Gilbert Stewart of, of, uh, of George Washington hanging over the fireplace, president's pictures of Texas there. Walks in and looks at it, and you know what the first three words out of his mouth were? Oh, my God. <laughs> this guy was raised an atheist in the Soviet Union. Seriously. And that's what, that is how powerful the office is. So, you know, but yet I saw there for seven years people, people walking into that Oval Office and you'd have the secretary of whatever here and the junior G person from level three of another cabinet department over here and they'd be sitting on those couches and President Bush would make certain that the junior G man or G woman, if they disagreed with the secretary of whatever, had their day. In fact, if they lost the argument, he'd be the first one to say, you did a good job because he wanted people to come in there and say what they believed and back it up. Whether they, whether they end up winning the argument or not, he knew that was important. And it showed confidence as a leader. Of course, Cheney went on to shoot my lawyer, but that's another story. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Malcolm. Andy, Andy Malcolm is originally from Montana, worked in the Bush campaign, and don't hold, him against, don't hold this against him, but he's a member of the editorial board of the L.A. Times. <laughs> no, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's a good guy. One of us. Shh, don't tell anybody. He's also got a fantastic blog. Andy, go ahead. What's the name of your blog? LATimes.com slash ticket. There we go. I'm not on the editorial board, and I'm writing exactly the opposite. There we go, excellent. Thanks. Carl, I know from personal experience that writing a book is a long, arduous, and often difficult process. I know also how uh, private you've kept much of your life. What did you learn about yourself in the process of writing the book that, that you now know that you didn't before? It's really tough. Andy's written how many books? Ten, Ten books. And uh, I wish he'd warned me how difficult it was going to be. But I liked writing the book. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was hard, hard work. Uh, and I had great editors. I, really had, I was really helped by fantastic editors. Um, one of them uh, is Priscilla Payton, who is at Simon & Schuster, who was the managing editor of Time magazine for many, many years. And uh, she was very tough. She would call me and say, I like what you've written, but here are four things you need to, you know, what, how did you feel? You know, what happened here? What happened there? The worst thing she did to me was I was really clacking along. I was going. I was blowing. I was going along. And last January, a year ago, she called me up and she said, God, I was turning in as I went along. And she said, I really like what I'm seeing, and you're really well along. But she said, um, you can't show up at the age of 42 in 1993 helping Bush run for governor. You know, you're kidding yourself if you don't think people want to know where you came from and how you became who you are. And she said, I've read the four biographies written about you, and I've made up a list of the ugly things that they say about you and your family in there, and just thought I wanted to be helpful, and I think you ought to, you know, here's your opportunity to set the record straight. Now, look, I'm not good, as Andy alluded to. Andy knows this. We're good friends. I don't like looking at my navel. <laughs> I just don't. And, you know, I am a relatively private person, despite the fact that I, you know, sort of, you know, I'm on television and in the Wall Street Journal and was sort of, you know... It was mentioned in the introduction, I, you know, I, I took a lot of arrows. Bush's his theory was, he said, better you than me. <laughs>
But uh, I ended up writing in the book about, uh, about my family and about my early years, and particularly about my mom and dad, who were attacked after they died by journalists who wanted to say something ugly about me. And that's fine if they want to say something ugly about me. I, can, I got a thick skin. One journalist once said he doesn't have nerve endings. <laughs> but I got a thick skin. But, but I wanted to set the record straight about my mom, who led a very troubled life and committed suicide when I was 31, and my dad, who was a really sweet guy who lived here in California and passed in 2004. And so the first chapter of the book was the most difficult to write because it was about me and my family. But it was a chance for me to set the record straight, and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, the time has come for us to uh, sign books. We're going to try and make this a little quick, uh, a little bit easier than normal. I've signed book plates that they've placed in a lot of books if you want to just grab a book and go home. And I've signed some other books uh, if you want to buy a book that I've signed. And then I'll stick around and sign for those of you who want to actually watch me inscribe my name <laughs> or have me inscribe it to you. But, but uh, I want to thank you again for having me here tonight. And thank you for all that you do to honor... Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.